and and you know we're gonna we're gonna talk uh, about uh, the solid principles again tonight, and you know our our show title, uh, solid principles, open close principle. So if you're watching us on Twitch, I bet in just a second you might see that get updated. But we'll go to uh, we'll we'll get started on that in just a second. You know the only the, the big news of the week for me was Microsoft Flight Simulator came out yesterday, and I've been looking forward to that a long time. Um, if you get a chance to watch some videos about just the photorealistic views of this uh, in 4K, heck, you don't even have to have, uh, let me tell you, you don't have to have a powerful machine and you don't have to play it in 4K. It's still amazing to fly over places that you know, places where you live, and look down at the ground and see these landmarks from the satellite data. It's just incredible. So I don't know if any of you, if either of you have gotten a chance to look at any of it, you know, I don't know, let me know, Andy or Rich, um, or have you just been hearing me talk about it for the last week, two weeks? No, I've seen and I've heard the announcements and it seems really cool. So do me a favor, look back up a sec. You said you don't need a lot of, um, a lot of hardware. Yeah. Um, first of all, is, is it free? So yeah. Microsoft Flight Simulator is not free. However, it is on PC Game Pass. And so a lot of gamers have either Xbox Game Pass Ultimate or they might just have PC Game Pass which is a heck of a lot cheaper than, you know, buying full price games. And, and they're always adding new games and Microsoft games are, are typically included there. Um, so, you know, if you have a halfway decent gaming PC, you should be able to play it now. I think even I was a little nervous that you would need this really powerful machine. But even if you're not playing on the highest settings and in 4K resolution, it's still astounding to look around your own neighborhoods and places you've lived and find like your your childhood home and say, wow, that's it. And that's the car in the driveway. It's just amazing. So um, you said if you have a decent gaming PC, so I don't own a gaming PC at all, right? I have a development machine. Um, right. So it's a decent machine. Like I always want, you know, people say you have to have a decent gaming machine. Yeah. I'm, I'm just a developer. Many of our viewers are, you know, maybe they're yep. developers. Right. Uh, I assume like my... My Surface Book is a, is a decent machine, right? So yeah, developer machines are pretty good. However, you do want a a GPU, a gaming level GPU, and and sometimes the ones in like your work PC might be okay, and sometimes they aren't. Um, and it's not because there's anything wrong with with the the general workspace lines. Like Nvidia calls them Quadro. I don't remember what AMD calls them. But right. the gaming community is looking for GeForce cards or on the AMD side, Radeon cards. Um, and Chops is excited about this because he's chiming in in the chat. How are you, Chops? Right. And right. Kev, yeah. Kev Griff's here too. Hey, Kev. Yeah, we got but, Kevin uh, Chops Griff. says, it's been on the show. Chops yeah. says, NVIDIA yep. told me I have to run on low, but the game set me to high end and it is running fine that way. So right. what right. do you think it costs? Like, do, you, do you recall at all what it costs? We could Google this or Bing it. Oh, so the base game is $60. They have a couple versions that add more airports and airplanes. But here's the thing about that, right? They've, they're they using satellite data from around the world to and, and, and artificial intelligence, machine learning-based artificial intelligence to basically take a look at a satellite image and say, well, looking at that, we're going to guess what the streets are. We're going to guess what the buildings are. We're going to make the buildings appear more three-dimensional. And, you know, it's pretty amazing. It's pretty amazing. So yeah, uh, and so one other question on that: yeah. uh, Is that a joystick game, or do you want to play with a keyboard? Like, because I don't have that, you know, joysticks right. or controllers and stuff. Right. So, um, Microsoft Flight Simulator has a long heritage of being a keyboard game, but I and and, and, you, and there are keyboard and mouse controls. My suggestion is that you probably do want to play with a controller. And one good place to go is if you have an Xbox One. Your Xbox One controllers, especially newer ones, are Bluetooth capable and they can join right up to your PC. Or you can get a USB cable. There is a USB right. out at the top of it and plug that into your PC. Flight okay. sticks are awesome, but I understand your point, Andy. What if you what if you just want to get started, right? What if yeah, you say, I just want to check it hey, out. I want to take a minor, you know, I'm not going to make this huge investment. I want to see how much fun I have. Right. So yeah. Well, that's cool. Hey, we got a bunch of people uh, watching the show right now. It's cool. Hello, everybody. Yeah. It's great to see, and thank you for being here. And you know, Flight Simulator has a legacy of a robust modding community. Third parties <laughs> make 
new planes. They extend the game in various ways. They add they add new game modes, new airports, new landmarks. And so you know, tonight. Can I, can I ask a quick question? Yeah. Yep. If I wanted to add something to that, would we have to recompile like the whole flight simulator? So there is a developer kit. Now I there's a developer program. What I haven't figured out yet is if the developer SDK is open to anyone or if you have to get into the program. Uh, uh, I did a little bit of looking into it yesterday because believe me, I'm intrigued by not so much adding the graphics part, but extending the game in other ways. There's been ideas floating around the web for years that what if you could add just a little bit of, of, um, of objectives to the game instead of just flying, maybe you gotta fly deliveries. Maybe you gotta plan your route, I, I don't know. So people could maybe make some some minor games, and I was kind of interested in that logic. I don't know that much more about it though. But no, you don't rebuild the game. You, uh, there's even a built-in store, and so that the, the community can can extend the game. It is a game that is open for extension. And I'm yeah. going to turn it over to Andy because tonight we're going to talk to our developer friends here about the open close principle. Wasn't yeah. that great? Wasn't that fantastic? <laughs> I like that. You know, honestly, I mean, I think that this, uh, first of all, I, mean, I think Flight Simulator, I just, I've heard like rave things about it, by the way. But you're right. This is a game that is open for extension, right? And we're talking about the open close principle. And we got a bunch of people out there. We've got uh, Kev Griff. Hello, Kev. I see uh, Chop. Well, we said hi to Chops. Humble J. Hello, Humble J. And uh, hello, everybody. Listen, if you're if you're new to the show, and I always find this funny, I'm, we're going to do what other streamers do. You haven't even heard us do anything important yet, but I'm still going to say, hit the hit the follow button. You know, like uh, join join our family. And uh, what does he say? Y'all streaming on? Yeah, it's only on on Twitch these days, Kev, because uh, our other thing is gone. Oh, we're not doing YouTube. Yeah, I guess we thought it was easier to. Uh, once once Mixer was gone, we, we figured we'd just make things easy. Um, and so we're just kind of going to one place only right now. But our archives are on YouTube. You can always check out the archives. And if you are seeing it on the archives, like us and subscribe to our YouTube channel, right? That's what we uh, – we, uh, we need all of our friends to help us grow and all that. Um, so yeah, so we we were doing this series that we started last week on the uh, solid principles of uh, often called the solid principles of object oriented design. I call them the solid principles of software development or, or software design or whatever. Um, and they are a great set of uh, tools, you know, skills, uh, principles to follow that developers can use to make their code. And I'm going to use the word to make your code better. Now, what does that mean to make your code better? Well, I just want to, again, we talked about this last week, and I don't want to spend as much time on it, but I think it's worth going through very quickly um, what we, um, let me go well, to the First of all, the slide. solid principles, the word solid in this term, solid principles, it's an acronym. Each letter stands for a principle. And last week yeah. on this show, we discussed the single responsibility principle. Yeah, hey, Z-Man's here. <laughs> That's great, man, Z-Man. Um, yeah, we talked about single responsibility. Today we're going to talk about um, open, closed, and we're going to continue this series on, um, and we're going to go through all of them. But, you know, real quick, I like to frame the conversation and say, well, why should we care about this? And we, we spent probably 15 minutes on it last week, I think. I don't want to do that every week, but I do think it's important to reiterate um, that the reason we want to do this, the solid principles of object-oriented and agile design, um, they're about dependency management for the most part. And poor dependency management leads to code that is hard to change, fragile, and non-reusable. And I can tell you that as an enterprise developer, that is my goal. I, I, sorry, well, that is not my goal. My goal is to have code that is easy to change and reusable and maintainable and readable. Like those are the bulls I'm looking for, right? Readable, changeable, manageable. Um, it's really important to be able to add features and uh, and enhance the software we build. So when, and it says on the other hand, when dependencies are well managed, the code remains flexible, robust, and reusable. And that 
to me is so important. And so this is such a great skill to have. And, you know, we see that I see it more and more coming up on interviews as well. The solid principles, people ask about that in their interviews. Um, can you do me a solid, my friend Z-Man? We'll always do you a solid. Um, so last week we talked about the single responsibility principle. Today, we're going to talk about the open closed principle. All right. Now, by the way, if you're watching these shows, we're going to go through each of these. Um, the series, it's not dependent. It's not required that you see the first one in order to watch the second one or the third one. But check them out on YouTube. If you missed last week, we have a show on the single responsibility principle. Today, we're talking about open closed. So what is open closed principle? And, and Chris was getting there, right? He was talking right about it. Software entities, classes, modules, functions, etc., should be open for extension, but closed for modification, right? And this was, you know, thought to be coined, you know, by Bertrand Meyer, uh, was the sort of father of the open closed principle. Um, so this is an interesting thing. Why do we want to have this happen? Like, why is this important, right? Let's talk about why. Well, we don't want to make our application, our applications need to be modifiable, if you will, right? We have to be able to change our application. We have to be able to add features or add logic and different things. But but we want them to be closed for modification, uh, which sounds sort of like a contradiction, right? The key is that we can open them for extension, meaning we can find other ways to let people make changes to the code that we need to that we need to make. And a lot of these things, they sound kind of weird until we start seeing it and we start thinking about it. So I don't know if that, that's it for slides, right? We, you know, we're yeah. not, this isn't a slide presentation. I just wanted to start off with that. Right. And, you know, I want to say, by the way, that one of the, this, I have this example to talk about, and it's not really the open closed principle, um, be, uh, you know, because the open close principle tends to be about object oriented design, right? About like the C sharp code. But let's talk about a connection string. Okay. Just think about that concept, right? A connection string. I might have some database logic, right? And I, where do I do? Do I hard code in that connection string? Chris, do you do that? You hard code in connection strings? Well, at first, no. <laughs> it, well, it's yeah, not a yeah, place yeah. where we want to land. Right, it's not a place. Not where a place wanna, where you want to land. Yeah, we know that in production is not going to be the same as where we're testing, and right. We so yeah, you still talking? No. Nope. Oh, sorry, oh. I thought I cut you off. Yeah, so what do we do? We take that connection string and we put it in a config file, and then our code says, you know, maybe it depends on if you're doing like .NET or whatever, but you know, you usually have it in some sort of config file, and then you have some code that says go get that connection string. And so what happens when we need to get the data from a different database, like you said, whether it's production or something like that, well, we don't change the code. We don't want to recompile the code because of that. I wouldn't, it's not exactly open for extension because you're not really extending the functionality of it, but isn't that the same point, right? We want to be able to make changes without having to get in there and change the code. And so I would I would sort of say that you know the first example of the open closed principle, while it's not an object oriented thing, is just that concept of having um, configuration external from your application, right? Configuration is a way to make changes. So um, again, it's not object oriented, but go ahead. I think so. Now, I think, you know, in the purest sense, these aren't really examples of the open closed principle, right? They're, I don't I don't think they really are. But it's a way of thinking, right? It's a way of thinking that I can control this application without changing it. Open closed is a way about like uh, feature flags again, and I'm using the same sort of example with configuration. Those tend to be um, turning something on and off maybe from a testing perspective, but once you go live, we're probably not changing, you know, at, at a certain point, we're not changing our configuration. We're not, um, you know, changing our feature. Well, we might turn things on and off, but but open close principle now to get more specific, you know, we're actually talking about 
adding, like enhancing our application on a sort of permanent basis. Like we want to add some new logic to the application, not just turn it on and off for a feature flag. But right. you're exactly right, Rich. You're following that same thought process I am. And, and I think it's a kind of a good intro to this because if you think about that, we've already been trained to do that. Right. We've been trained to make configuration files external. We've been starting to hear more and more about things like uh, config management, right? And feature flags and things like that. And I yeah. think it sort of leads into this. It's almost like yeah. a, uh, like a, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, when you get the first little taste, you know, it's almost like a lead in or, a, you know, like a, well, you just said it. Uh, it's like a teaser for what we're doing. <laughs> It's like a teaser, but, right? But exactly. You know what I think since since let's let's focus the conversation a little bit for folks who maybe are new to the solid principles in general, maybe kind of new to C sharp, but you do understand object oriented programming. I believe that we're gonna land here saying that th this O in open closed applies to the code we write. So it's not necessarily while these are all great important things to externalize configuration or use feature flags to to allow your software to be modifiable without a complete recompile or rebuild. I think <laughs> what it sounds like I'm hearing you say, Andy, is we're gonna see principles that when you build classes or methods the first time, all of our developers, whenever they get any kind of request for change, don't have to go in and, and hack them all apart, that they are designed to be added onto in some way. And that's what I think we're gonna see. Yeah, and by the way, I, I'm just going to repeat something I see in the chat in case someone's watching on YouTube later. Apparently, Rich was talking and we, we didn't hear his audio, uh, but that's going to be fixed going forward. So sorry about that. Rich was throwing some comments at me. So, um, yeah, and so the same thing, by the way, the same thing we talked about with the single responsibility principle. Why, I'll just throw this question out to you guys to see if you were paying attention last week. Like, why don't we want to make changes to our code, right? Because Because I could leave my code open for modifications, right? But why would that be a bad thing? Well, our code has to change because when you build a product, inevitably, especially if it's for work, inevitably there's gonna be more to do. So we know that our product has to change, that our software has to change. But what we've also learned, I think as developers and why principles like this were created is or at least discovered and 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 you know uh, elucidated by somebody like like Bertrand Meyer, is to say, hey, you know, if you just get in there and find, just go find the spot in the code that does something, and now say, well, in a different case, I want to do something else. Well, now you throw like some little if logic in there, but where are you going to get the information on whether or not you should do something else? Do you have to go get that from somewhere else? And how do you share that? And and then eventually, I think us with a little more experience, right? is we, we can already see the future that all this code's gonna get tied together in knots and there's gonna be, we're, everybody's gonna be diving into these same monster classes and functions to do things. And, uh, and in the end, it's, it's if, what I think we're gonna see, and I don't, I don't wanna jump the gun on it, I, I don't wanna jump to what you're doing, it's just that um, I feel like what we're gonna talk about is, is how do we build our, our classes and methods so that they, they don't require these extensive changes to add new features. You do right. it in some other way. And we have the, Humble yeah. Jay in the chat who's mentioning that he's taken Java and, and he's absolutely right when he says that C Sharp and Java are, are not just, they're said to be similar, right? Yeah, I learned Java start to start with, as a matter of fact. And all these principles we're talking about here, Humble Jay, these are not C Sharp solid principles these are software principles i see examples people use this stuff with java all the time this is great stuff to know they're probably not going to teach this in maybe like first semester java uh actually it says wait i'm taking c sharp class in my next semester but i know J oh okay i see what he's saying yeah yeah i miss i misread that so he's taking c sharp next and these but these principles apply across everything but chris the thing i'm trying to get at with this is the why don't we want to go in and change our code why not leave it just open for modification? Because if we modify it, we're going to break it. That's the thing. That's the takeaway. We're trying, I'm trying to build up to a why is this important. Because if I go in and change an application, change some code, change a method, I'm going to break it. I'm going to screw up what exists already, and we don't want to let that happen. Changes, we should be able to make changes to an application without breaking existing functionality.
Okay. Yeah. That, that's sort of what I was trying to get to. Well, let's show some okay. code samples. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I, I think if you so, tie that back to what you had last week, right, the less you have to go into something and yes. modify something, then the less chance of breaking it. Rich, that's, that's what I was trying to get at. It's like that same theme that goes through these solid principles is we don't want to break our existing code. And, and I'm being honest, like I will break it. Like I'm a pretty good developer. I mean, you know, whatever, right? I will break it. I will make a mistake and I will break something. It's just inevitable that human nature, that's what we do. So let's take a look. I got my screen go. Okay. You've got my screen up here. So I have this sil silly example here about the very closed adder. This job is to add something. And what does it do? It adds one and two. Okay. Now this is uh, obviously a, a simple, stupid example here. But this is closed for modification. Like I can't even, like all this does is add one plus one. If I want to add this changes to be one plus two, I have to come in here and change the code and recompile it, right? Now this is stupid and we, we well, I shouldn't say that, but we probably wouldn't write code like that. We would probably write it like what's below. I want to add int A and int B and return the result of them. But this method, I can now change the behavior of this method by providing different parameters to it. Again, this is just very uh, sort of intro level open for extension, but haven't I extended this method by making it open? There's a lot of ways something can be open. One way is by parameters, right? Now, if I really wanted to make this better, I might do something even different, right? And again, we'll get into more complicated examples, but in this case, how about I take an array because what happens when I have this method and someone says, hey, Andy, I'd like you to extend this method. I would like you to not just add A and B, but I'd like you to add in, uh, A and B and C, right? And I didn't really think about that when I designed this. I didn't really make it open, okay? A way to take this simple method and make it more open is to do this example here, right? Adding a list of integers, right? In this case, it's an array, but I'm, and, right? As easy as can be, okay? Now, again, we're gonna start with simple examples and, and build up to some more interesting examples. If you were watching last week, um, I showed something similar to this membership validator. Remember this in the single responsibility, I was talking about this. Let's say someone wants to join our website and they create an account and they want to validate, we want to validate the account that it's valid, right? Account has two properties. It has a username and it has a password. And we know that this is some really silly uh, validation logic, but yet it's validation logic just the same, right? We're gonna validate that the username length is a certain size. We're gonna validate that the uh, username is an email. And of course, any good developer can tell you, you know it's an email if it has an at symbol. And we're gonna make sure that our password is really strict and is at least five characters. Oh, this one, there's a, there's a typo, this should say password. Look at that. So these are our rules, okay? And so now we compile this application, we compile this and we ship it and it's working great. And then someone comes up and goes, you know, Andy, um, I think our password uh, strength isn't really strong enough. Or maybe we also want to check that the password contains some special characters or something like that. So, well, I could come in here and change this. I could say, you know, if something else. But what happens when I do that? Well, you know, a lot of times what I do, and, I, you know, again, this is something I, I could screw this up by mistake, right? I could be like typing my new code and go, okay, if... And what happened by mistake, I deleted that, I, I removed a rule. I didn't do it on purpose, but I wasn't really paying attention. And I'm doing if account password dot, you know, contains and whatever, I'm looking for something. But what happened by mistake, I, I overwrote this text and it happens, right? Now, of course, um, unit tests would, would help for that, right? There's other things we could, we could, there's other ways to solve for that problem. But what if this is complex logic and I have to change logic? I don't want to have to do that. So what I want to do is I want to be able to add new validation logic without changing my validate user method. All right. So how might I do that? Let's take a look. So what I'm going to do is I have this membership validator and my membership validator has a, um, in its constructor, it takes a collection of rules, right? 
Now, what is a rule? A rule is just something that has a method that can be run on it or something like, you know, I'll show you what the rule looks like. And oh, so I want to I want to say something that I didn't mention today that we talked about last week on the show. Uh, I did a quick intro about these design principles. Design principles like these aren't specific to how you achieve them, right? These are ideas. These are concepts that we want to put into place. So by no means do you have to do write code like I'm writing code in order to have uh, a proper following of the open closed principle, right? There's a you could write code a million different ways to do this. I'm simply suggesting here is one way to open up this membership validator. Okay, so I'm going to pass in a list of rules, and then when we call the validate user, we take that account and we loop through the list of rules and we run the validation logic on uh, of each one of them. And now I can add more rules. You see how I can do that, right? I could put as many rules as I want into here without changing the validate user uh, functionality. Because you might imagine maybe there's some other code, you know, here, and there's some other code here, whatever it is. I, I'm trying to keep the example simple, but but somewhat realistic. Yeah. But what I want to be able to do is change one rule without breaking another. And so what would a rule look like? I mean, the rules are pretty simple, right? In this case, and there's a lot of ways to do this, I'm having a simple abstract class called a rule that has a validate method. And then I have this username length rule. This is the same code I had before, right? Nothing special going on here. This one, uh, so we have a username length rule. We have a username must be an email rule. And we have a password length rule. And I could add as many rules as I want, as long as... Um, as long as this logic works, right? In other words, what I don't show here is how to get these rules into this membership validator. And that could be done via dependency injection. Um, you might have some sort of uh, logic that goes and fetches rules from all the DLLs. I mean, there's a lot of ways to do this kind of stuff. You know, one thing I always think is it would be cool for this and something that you never see anymore. Remember MEF? Yeah, I remember MEF. I, oh, yeah. The... the uh... Oh gosh! Of course, it. I just, forget what it stood for. Was I it just lost it? Right? Something. Yeah. Extensibility, extensibility framework. framework. But that whole reason, thing was based them. on like it would look through your libraries, look through your DLLs, and find things that like met or had an attribute on them or something like that. I think right with that kind of concept. And there's other ways to achieve this. You could add as many DLLs you want and just drop rules in, and this thing would automatically pick them up. Right? Yep. Yep. I so. I remember the, the managed extensibility framework. Yep. Managed extensibility That's, framework. And, and yeah. you know, the funny thing about it is, is it didn't really get a whole lot of use in, in like widespread, but certain organizations would adopt it because it was kind of what they were looking for. Oh yeah. But since yeah. it didn't, it didn't come with a major release of .NET like two or four. It just sort of happened and it still works. It's still out there. Yeah. So, so, so that would be like a cool, um, a cool, uh, you know, that would be a cool way. But the point is the, the implementation isn't specific, right? The, the principle doesn't say you need to do anything. But hopefully from this example, you could see that I could add a lot of rules and every rule I take. Now, uh, sorry, this is not the right one. The rules would theoretically, I took a little shortcut here. I put them all in one file. And theoretically, these would all be in different places. They could be in different DLLs, that, you know. I, I won't I wouldn't break one by changing another right right um, is this is it now now let me let's take a step backwards here and say would I do this <laughs> so quite frankly I probably would start out with code that looked a little bit more like this in this example Right. I'm not saying that this is necessarily wrong. There's no right or wrong way to write software. And so for something simple like this, would I, and this is what we talked about last week with the single responsibility principle. Where do we choose to draw the line? How far do we want to take these principles? And, you know, I'd be curious to hear from viewers or, and, and certainly from uh, Rich and Chris, you know, um, does this have a smell to you, this particular validate user method that you'd say, oh man, 
I shouldn't be, I wouldn't have written it that way. I would have broken that up because this is dangerous. You know, like we have to pick and choose our battles, right? Well, here's the thing. <clears throat> At the time that you're writing this, is it obvious? Is it like plainly obvious that the rules are going to change? They're going to need to be different per customer, different per department, different per whatever the reason is. And sometimes that stuff's obvious up front. Other times, maybe it seems like, you know, I feel like it's always going to be this way. Maybe right. the skill that is that you want to recognize that what you've built can't be easily modified and at least say it's kind of like everything. You have an escape plan for, for situations. Do you yes. have do you have a plan where you look at this and say, you know, if I had to come back to this, I at least know what it is I would do. Right. Right. It, it is good to have that. And some of that just comes from experience. You know, like I would I would note it. I could come back. And the, also, the difference might be like, how complicated are these rules? Like these are simple. But each one of these rules could be, you know, 20 lines or something like that. And if I saw it looking like complex like that, then I might think like, oh, man, I got to get these rules out of here. These things are complex. But um, you have to develop a sort of um, a smell and a comfort level. Yeah. And I said, this is a good thing to talk about with a team, right. with the architect, like how strict do we want to be with something like the open close principle? And I think, um, you know, with single responsibility, it's a little easier, I think, to break some of these things up. And, and it might seem excessive if I wrote this application like this, you know, with these rules, you guys might think like, wow, Andy, you know, you're getting a little like, sure, that's great. Wow. But, you know, did we need it? I don't know, right? Um, and if anybody has any, you know, thoughts on, do we really need it? Um, are we frozen? No, I don't think so. Okay, I don't know. I must be seeing things on a delay. I don't see Chris moving on something, but all right. Um, so, is Chris frozen? No. Chris? Maybe. Chris? So, um, well, while we're, you know, we're, we're going to continue with this. You know, I was just thinking, Rich, I realized, and this was not like a stage thing. I realized that I am not using presentation mode, which is what I used last week. And All I think right. I want to switch it because it's pretty easy. I don't know if you guys that are watching the stream have seen, yeah, Chops, Chris. Oh, I think Chris is back. I see him moving now. Yeah. Um, there's a little bit of a delay for the stream, so people might. Chris, are you there? Yeah, I can hear you guys. Oh. We yeah, couldn't you hear you. We're frozen for a while. Um, so okay. I'm going to switch into presentation mode just because it only takes a second, and I think it's a good thing to do. Uh, so presentation mode allows me to go to Visual Studio and change the font sizes for everything. And I, I should have done it beforehand, and I, I kind of forgot. So um, it doesn't show the history. Let's go to open, open a project. It doesn't even show that project in here. That's the whole thing to, to presentation mode that it really is a whole different instance of Visual Studio. And so uh, even the things it remembers are different. But what are we doing? We're doing open closed. I'm gonna go to the solution here. Um, it, oh, it opened in the wrong window. So let's see how different it looks, by the way. This is a little little segue here. I'm gonna come back to open closed principle in a second, but a Visual Studio is taking longer to open than I thought it would, really quick. Um, come on. Oh, it's not going anywhere. That's not good. Oh, so, um, yeah, I don't know if people have seen this. Um, man, I've seen presentation. Here it goes. Here's presentation mode. So here's presentation about, mode. You were talking. Hello, Chris, Rich, am I with you or? You're good. I just You're good. Keep going. Okay. I don't hear Chris. Do you? Not yet. Okay. Yeah, I actually don't know if you can hear me. I'm not 100 percent sure. All right. You're so low. yeah. So this is um this is presentation mode. Look at the font sizes here, right? I can toggle between the two, and this is small. The cool thing is this is customizable. I can set the fonts for all these things as much as I want. I can choose to have a dark background regularly, but when I'm doing presentations, I can have a light background. All the things that you might want to change when you're doing a presentation, uh, but you don't want to have to change it like manually each time. And it even says I'm in demo mode up here. So just for performance reasons, I'm going to close this. And that should help my machine out a little bit. And so I'm going to close all these. So anyway, that was um, presentation mode. I kind of wanted to show you guys that. 
um, and take a little segue because hopefully it makes it easier for you guys to uh, to watch. Uh, Bruno asks, "Does the uh, there's a couple of good comments here." Uh, Kev Griff says Yagni, right? And maybe Yagni. I think what he was saying, we were talking about like, do I really need? Did I really need to take the open close principle um, into account here? Right? Did I need to make it this complicated? Yagni, you ain't gonna need it. And he's saying like, I should probably be looking and saying, you know, do I really think I need to make this particular code extensible? There's reasons why I might. There's reasons why I, I wouldn't. And then Bruno says, does the smell oh. come from the fact? of knowing the principles, or is it there before that? Not sure if I worded that right, though. So um, that's an interesting thing. I think this, the principles give your code smell. It helps create boundaries for you, right? You might have never seen the principle, and maybe you look at code and go, wow, this thing looks complicated, too complicated, for whatever reason, right? Or too hard to follow, too hard to understand for one reason or another. Um, if you know, uh, and then you have to figure out a way to, to resolve that, right? You know, it's just sort of a preference. You know, how, how can I resolve the, this smell that I found where it just doesn't seem right? On the flip side, um, the knowing and learning these principles and sort of um, having that experience gives you a framework. It sort of helps you to develop these code smells, right? I mentioned last week that I also think it helps for code reviews, right? As a code review, you might, you know, if you study these principles and, and you follow them and your and your team decides you want to follow them, you could put them into place um, and sort of let them be a reference sort of for your smell or like a, you know, a guide. Uh, and I think uh, Z-Man's right saying that, you know, it's an art, right? And, uh, you know, we have to sort of know when to do, when to do what. There is certainly no one way to do it, uh, any of these things. So, um, you know, experience and, uh, and teamwork help, you know, you bounce it off other developers. What do you, what do you guys think? Is this, is this too much? Is this too little? Um, anyway, I had another example, um, that I was thinking about, which is like this order calculator. Now I was trying to write some code samples for this, right? This isn't anything real, but I was thinking about, and I, I had all these different variations of this order calculator as I was trying to come up with like, what would be a good demo? But, you know, here's an example that might be a case that would be more robust, uh, that maybe I would really do it with the open close principle. And again, I didn't write it, um, I didn't make this thing too complicated, but let's just say I have this method called, or this thing called an order calculator, and I wanna calculate the total, right? Now, by the way, I put a default tax rate in here, cause I wanna, I have to figure out what the tax rate is to do this, right? It's my silly little example here. Um, so the first thing, you know, I was saying before, well, I didn't really make this thing very extensible. I forced the tax rate into a constant here. That's the default tax rate. I can move that into a config file. Not exactly open close principle, but still along the lines of what we're talking about. And then I have this calculate total. And let's say I have this switch statement here. And I have this first case, like if the state is Pennsylvania, then I'm going to, um, Take all my items and sum them up, sum up the price of them and times it by 1.06, right? Um, there are no unit tests on this. I don't know if there's a typo in here or anything like that, by the way. Uh, and of course, by the way, another way to make it extensible would be to have the rates in a database or something where I can easily change the rates. Tax rates change, right? I think most developers would think I should put this in some file somewhere. I shouldn't have this hard coded. Um, so then let's just say there's some other rule, and I don't think this is real. I made this up for Pens for New Jersey. Uh, I don't know what the tax rules are, you know, but let's say in New Jersey, well, here we have this taxable items and non-taxable items. So I think what I say, let's add up all the orders where the, it's not food and charge that by the tax rate and then take all the non-taxable items and sum them up and then add these two, right? And then um, that would be our, our total. And then if you're not in New Jersey or Pennsylvania, then we just use the default tax rate, right? This is like the silly little um, example, right? So how could I make this more extensible? Like how would I make this open for modification, uh, open for extension? 
Well, I would probably want to take out all these situations. Um, and these things can get really complex, right? I was thinking about other examples where you might need to calculate the tax first and then add in fees and shipping and like all these different things that might be different in different states. Maybe we charge shipping and in Delaware, but we don't charge shipping in, you know, Connecticut or whatever it is, right? There's a lot of examples that could come up in here. So, um, so what I did in this case was, let's see, I have this order calculator. And in this case, I'm using, I like using like a, a factory pattern, or you could use like a service locator, which I actually like better, but I, did, but I was just writing a quick sample here. So in this case, here's a great way to make things like you would wonder, well, how do I get these dependencies that are different for each one of the states or whatever? So maybe I have a tax calculator factory. And then in my calculate total, I say, hey, tax calculator factory, get me the calculator that I need for this particular order, right? Now, how does the calculator figure out which one to return? I don't know. Let's, we could take, I, I don't even think I implemented it. It might simply say, if the state is New Jersey, give me the New Jersey tax calculator. And if the state is Pennsylvania, give me the Pennsylvania tax. There's a lot of ways we could do that, right? Does that make sense for you guys so far? Yeah. Okay, good. Because I don't want to just hear myself talk the whole time. You know, I like to <laughs> hear you guys. talk. Yeah. So, it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, and then, of course, we would just call the tax calculator and calculate the tax, right? And now I can modify these calculators, right? And then all I'm doing is now taking the uh, items, uh, summing them up, and time and adding in the tax amount. But maybe I have some other things in here like a fee calculator, a shipping calculator. You know, there's all kinds of different ways to do that. Take all those pieces of logic and make them, um, you know, and have them outside of the class so we can, we can uh, this, this would be open. This, this class is very open. I can have as many different calculators as I need. Um, and that's, you know, that's sort of the open close principle. Now there's a lot of, Edge cases, you know, the, the, the problem with some of these things is I think it's sort of a, a state of mind. It's a way of thinking, right? Sometimes you want to implement it. Sometimes you don't. Um, I can't tell someone when they should, you know, try to do something like that. But what you need to do is just have these ideas, these concepts in your, in your toolkit, in your brain, and apply them, you know, where you think they could come in handy. You know, I'm with you. We're just debugging a little bit of an audio issue, making sure we're good. Um, okay. So, and maybe this is just coming at it from a different angle, but when we think about um, extending classes, extending uh, code out, right? You do that because you can't do something on that, or you won't don't really want to do something to that base class. Didn't really see anything that kind of shows that here, but that's part of what we do as well when we think open closed. Well, or am yeah, I thinking about that wrong? Case, no, I think you're right. In this case, the ba well, it depends what you mean by base class. If you're talking about inheritance, uh, sure. well, more of those extension methods, right? You've got some. Uh, I, I know we used to do this with with uh, with strings and yes. with lookups for certain. Uh, certain classes you might get as part of the framework, but they don't do some of the things that you want it to do, whether it's iterating through a collection or pulling out, uh, changing collection objects from one property to type to another, those kind of things. Yes. So you end up creating yes. your own, uh, your own extension to that object so that you can get the functionality that you want. Yeah, I think extension methods are great. I'm curious, you know, again, anyone who's who's following online and wants to throw in, like, do you guys use extension methods regularly? I like them. I think they can be really helpful. Um, uh, but I guess the thing with some of these things are, like, extension methods are there. I, I guess you could, you could say, and I'm, I'm not sure if this is a correct statement. I'm just thinking this as I'm saying it, right? Mm -hmm. I guess you could say that we need extension methods 
because the class wasn't written open in the first place, right? Uh, and some things can't really be open. I mean, there's no way of knowing everything that someone might need to do to a string, right? right? And so we write these handy extension methods on string or on lists. I do it all the time, right? Um, however, in this case, we could kind of have the forethought to think, I think the tax rules are going to be different in different places and it's going to get complicated. And so the open close principle, remember, is for the developer who's writing the base class, that original class, right? To Not enable come along later. the developers who come after to add features to it, right? Does that make sense? I think I follow what you're putting there. You know, so like an extension method is, I don't want to, I don't know if, I don't want to overstate it and say it's a hack, but like an extension method is we need that because the class wasn't extensible in the first place. Right. Gotcha. And so we use that all the time. Right. And, and it's not a bad thing. And some yep. classes don't need, you know, especially if it's, there's so many use cases where, where extension methods are perfectly great ways to, to extend things. Um, but, um, this is a way so open remember the open close principle is the original developer writing that thing so whoever wrote the string class back in the first version of .NET, right yeah and i'm not criticizing them at all right but the first c sharp developers writing the string class it's not open for extension right right uh, and probably shouldn't be i mean it is a true root level base class you know right you, you can't have everything be I, I, we, we don't want to get us into chaos and, and you have, you know, dogs and cats living together and everything like that. So, um, so, but open closed is for, it's designing your software that you're building. And again, you know, again, string is a, is a type, uh, open closed is something you would apply to software systems. I think you would say, right. To types certainly, but to the software we're building. Um, and I hope that sort of helps. Uh, now, I think extension methods are a great method for extending uh, things. That's that's what they're for. Um, but it's a little different. Okay. I think that helps. Um, yeah, I think so. Um, Do we lose Chris? I see Chris moving yeah. around in our internal video, but I don't see him out on the stream. I'm just saying, like, so. Yeah, it's, it's Chris, I'm in the call, but I don't know if you can hear me. I can hear Chris. We can hear you now. Oh, okay. I don't know if he's going out to the stream, but I can hear him talking. You want to bring yeah. him back in? Chris, love to have you on the show, of course, you know. Well, like you were saying uh, about extension methods, right? Like, just the well, fact I that we have them. Wait a sec, because I just want to make sure your audio is going out. Uh, is he in the show? His, his audio is fine, yes. Oh, okay. Yeah, we just, like, I, um, I turned the camera off, because I yeah, think Chris I turned the camera off to save some bandwidth. To make no, sure that I, just, I, I don't actually know what happened. I just, no. because my call never ended or anything, it just... It didn't sound like you could hear me most of the times when I was talking, and it looked like I was freezing up there a lot. So, yeah, hey, it glitches it just right now. Live, live stuff. So, what were you saying, Chris? Well, like to your point about extension methods, is is just as long as we we're careful not to confuse a lot of our listeners or or viewers, is that um, they don't open the class. The class is still very much closed. You still cannot go in and do anything to the class whatsoever. They're just a way to write a method that sort of acts as though it were part of the class, but it still has to act on it completely externally, which is not a bad thing. It's just not the open close principle. I, I, I was looking at what you were doing here, and it got me thinking about two types of code that C Sharp and Java developers, I think, are used to that I think, I think are... Um, that I think do represent this principle. One of them, Rich alluded to, is inheritance. If I, and I know that inheritance is, is definitely out of vogue compared to where it was when object-oriented programming C-sharp and Java hit the landscape, right? Um, but I mean, if, if, if you came up with uh, an abstract class that, that was the tax calculator and then you implemented a lot of different classes, then then that's one way. But I think a more modern way that developers today are looking at, especially after the design patterns book was written, is something like the strategy pattern. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think that's a good that's a good use case. Um, sure. 
Yeah, the strategy pattern. I mean, that's sort of, um, it's kind of similar, um, I think, right? To like, this, each class has its own strategy, right? That's the whole idea, right? And you, would you, wouldn't you use... Like, how do you, how do you, I'm trying to think off the top of my head, like the strategy pattern, how you uh, would implement that in this case, like how different the implementation would be. Oh, well, you know, in a, a lot of times the strategy pattern is actually used in like a sales tax calculator because what happens is, is, and, and is, you know, you're, you make a decision which strategy to use right? and then you usually expose an interface, but I don't even want to. I don't even want to try and, and get it into concrete C-sharp terms because just because you use C-sharp interfaces or an abstract factory, there's still strategies. It's still a selection of the algorithm yes. to be used, which is then used by the generic, uh, the generic um, algorithm runner, <laughs> which you like to call an orchestrator. Um, <laughs> I, I don't want to confuse those patterns, but essentially that's, that's what we're doing there. So... Yeah, sorry, I'm taking a quick drink here. Um, yeah, so the, I mean, that's, I just had a few samples to show. Um, the whole point is, you know, a lot of times we take this, this solid principles and we cram all five of them into an hour. We're trying to take a, like a deeper look into each one, have some conversations about them, but there's only so much to say. Well, you about. said something earlier that actually was really important, I think. We, we sort of shrugged off overuse of the principle as either Yagni or, you know, you ain't going to need it. So like, you know, don't, don't start with that or some intuition where we say, Hey, hey I think we don't have to do this yet. Now, what would be super valuable is if we got better, Here, yeah. you know, folks like us were better at, at being able to explain when and why. Um, and, and yes, I agree that a lot of this is intuition. And maybe that's where we ask our viewers. We ask for you, for you in the comments or in the chat or just as this conversation goes on with this video living on YouTube to say now, what are the situations that make you say, hold on, I need to open this membership validator. Um, and it's not about the implementation that Andy showed tonight. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about what led to the decision. And I'm going to throw out one example and then I'll, I'll, I'll be quiet and hear your thoughts is, is, what if you're writing an application where you realize that different customers are need different validation rules? Now, I'm not talking about whether that's you're going to build some fancy uh, front end interface for them to define the rules and store those in a database. It's not about that. It's opening this class for extension. And in order to do that, you can't just put those rules in here. If, if the rules are what need to be extended, they need to somehow be added to this, whether by inheritance, strategy, dependency injection. Sure. Yeah, no, I think that's a good example because in, in your case, um, you're saying that like, you know, different customers need different things. And so we know we're going to have more customers. And so we can logically assume we're going to have more situations that we need to handle. In the case I had, you could write the application from the beginning and kind of think it's going to stay static the way it is, right? But uh, when you know you have something like that, um, yeah, yeah. And a matter of fact, I mean, I think in general, you know, one of the products I work on or, or worked on a lot was like a rules engine, right? The whole point of a rules engine uh, is that there's going to be lots of more rules, and each situ situation has to have has to apply uh, ten of them, fifty of them. You know, it's like any number of them would want to have it. And so, yeah, if you were building your example with like some sort of specific customer logic, then I, I think you would, you would probably think from the beginning, like, Hey, I should make this application open for extension, but are you doing it for different purposes? Right. I, I don't know. I don't, maybe it doesn't matter, but the goal. So there's, there's like two different goals, right? And they're both going to be maybe solved. Two different problems, maybe I'll say, that are both solved by the open close principle. One is like you said, we have a dynamic system that we know is going to be dynamic, and we need to be able to do dynamic things with it, you know. Um, and so making it open is a really good choice. Another example, though, is again, this is where the, the code smell, this is where the tricky part comes in, but 
I want my application, even though it's not as complex as the situation that you mentioned, Chris, but I want it to be open, right? Because, um, because there are going to be enhancements that come down the road, right? So that those are two sort of two different sort of ways of thinking that might both have me arrive at the open close principle, you know? Right. So, um, yeah. I win a method or a class is closed. I think we've seen some examples. And so, yeah, the trick is figuring out when, when and how do we go ahead and put in that investment and and I agree that gosh we chalk it up so much to just experience and I and I we might we're, well I imagine we're not going to solve all of the developer community's problems tonight but I'm just looking for that guidance that's a little bit yeah. better than just than just gut feel like I, I hear feel what like saying, wow man. that's that's everything that's wrong with what we do right <laughs> yeah yes yeah. so you're saying like so let's say you're a developer uh, and you're a couple years into this and you come to us and the best answer we have for you is. Yeah, I don't know. You'll figure it out after you do this for a few more years. That's kind of lousy advice to give. Is what you're, that's what you're saying, right? Yeah, yeah, it is exactly what um, I'm saying. <laughs> yeah, that's kind of that's, but that's the best we have, right? Um, we've learned from our mistakes. There's not um, there's not a simple. These aren't simple answers and simple simple questions because. Um, because we have, there's other circumstances. So I would say this, you know, given unlimited money and time and resources, I would just go to town with this thing, right? Like, let's make everything open. Like, why not, right? But knowing that the boss is, is expecting features to be shipped and, and product out the door, well, do I really have to make this particular class open? You know, can I make it a little quicker? Um, I think, though, there is a point where when you get good at this stuff, the open part doesn't take that much more time, right? So you could argue that if you err on the side of open, you know, why not, right? Like, let's face it, in this example, it took me, you know, take a couple minutes to type this, or obviously, right? It wouldn't take long. Um, Typing this and, you know, if I really thought about it, like, this isn't so hard to write. This didn't take me that much longer. So in that case, you know, you could make the argument like, well, let's make this thing more open. Um, do I have more files? Yes. Does that matter? Not really. You know, so. But I don't I don't have an answer on, on how to, you know, so what would we say to a, a, a newer developer? Like, what better advice could we give them? I would say, think about these things. You know, maybe that's the answer, right? I've I've worked with developers over the years, and, and I've probably been this developer as well, so I'm not trying to pick on anybody else, that doesn't think about the software we're writing, right? Maybe the answer is sometimes you have to stop and think and say, what am I building here? And... You know, what's its purpose? Where, where is this going? How is the right way to build this? Instead of just typing code, right? Instead of just going at it as fast as you can, you pause and you think about it a little bit. Um, and maybe that's the maybe that's the, the strategy is pause. Right. Yeah, and I think when you say that, that's one of those things you don't think of a, a junior developer necessarily having that, <clears throat> excuse me, that skill set to think to take that pause and that break. Yeah. So here's kind of where, where I'm at with this is, is uh, when I, the very first software I, uh, the very first piece of software I ever wrote was on an Atari computer sitting in a Sears where you basically could start typing in basic. And what did most of us do? You, I watched somebody go up there and type 10 print, hi, and their name, and then they said go to 20 go to 10 and then i i was inspired by watching mm -hmm. that person do that because i can't tell you for how many years i walked by that machine and the machine would say please enter your name but what it really meant was to enter the program name to run and so people would walk by that machine and type in their name and it would say syntax error and i watched that for months and months and months and i'm, I'm i don't know how old i am eight nine years old right and i walked by one day and i watched a gentleman 
typed those same lines that that Z Man Philly just typed into chat. Ten print hello Chris twenty go to ten. And I will tell you, part of the reason I'm sitting here right now is because I was inspired by that what I watched. Yeah. In basic, we wrote a program. Right. We could jump some lines of code and guess what? People wrote Microsoft Casino in basic. Somebody wrote Microsoft Decathlon in basic. These were full-fledged games with one, what we would call today, one function. There wasn't even a concept of a main. So I guess the reason I'm saying this is because it can be done writing the big function that does it all with all kinds yes. of branching and if and else and go test this and go test that. It can be done. But we have learned and what we try to teach our new developers is you aren't going to be happy when you have to go fix that. Yeah. You're in big trouble. So what you try to tell them is you try to take them aside. And, and I say this like I've got some, you know, some developer on my team I'm taking aside. This, I love mentoring people, but it doesn't happen every day. But we try to tell ourselves, hey, I'm going to implement a, a, a calculator for sales tax. Well, gosh, I, I don't even have to think to know that sales tax is different in the United States in every jurisdiction. And sometimes... It's different within states. Sounds like that's going to be complicated. And we need a way so that there isn't one place that everybody's got to get into to change how things work in Delaware and in California and in a certain county in California. And when they change the law and now bottled water is taxed or it's not taxed. Yeah. So I feel by the yeah, you keep going. It gets us there. The open close principle helps us. And the reason why it's part of these solid principles is so to go back to what you said at the beginning is so that we write code that's more maintainable and we're not stuck at work. We we can right. keep we can get back to work and, and do our jobs. <laughs> yeah. So the one thing I, I feel like I have to say is you know, you're talking about that those those two lines of code, 10 uh and then you know, 20 says go to 10. You talk about remembering the first time you saw that. Well, the first time I saw those lines of code written, it was Z-Man Philly who was writing them. Because Z-Man is responsible for me being, I mean, back to high school, he's responsible for me uh, being a software developer. So uh, I feel that was an interesting uh, thing to throw out there. But, you know, um, you know. We'll accept Z-Man's apology on our next show. No, go yeah. ahead. <laughs> <laughs> that was awesome. That was awesome. Uh, yeah, Rich says it's your fault, Zima. Yeah, totally. Um, so, yeah, and it was on an Atari, right, which is the funny thing. Exactly. So um, one of the things I guess I want to say, you know, we're struggling with some of this stuff. And we're struggling with this because struggling with this is a real-world scenario. That's what we want from this show, Right. I, we could easily do a presentation, a recorded presentation with no feedback and say, this is how you follow the open close principle. And someone could get that takeaway and understand the principle and still not really be sure or not fully understand it. We have that conversation on this show and we're saying, yeah, we get it. Sometimes we use it. Sometimes we don't. How do we figure it out? It's not always easy to know. And when I look at the solid principles, I would say that open close principle as, as important as it is and as, uh, as great as it can be for solving problems, I will admit that it's not a principle that I follow to the letter of the law. I certainly don't push it uh, with some examples. I just don't think when I'm writing code that in this particular example, I just don't need to make this thing open. Like it won't be that hard for me to fix later. Um, sometimes I'm right. Sometimes I'm wrong. Um, and the point I'm getting at is if, you know, Chris, you're struggling, you know, I know you want to have that advice for the new developer. And I think that is our advice for the new developer is it's okay to have these conversations, right? No one's expected to just know these things. We talk about them. There's, it's not always so simple looking at this. Uh, so hey, here's, so the hardest part of the open closed principle is probably, when should I use it and when shouldn't I use it? Not not actually implementing it, right? Right. You should know what it is. You should know how to spot it. You should yeah. know how to spot a class that's that's hard or impossible to change without diving in into it. And then you make a decision whether or not to invest in changing it. Yeah. 
Yeah. Yeah. Maybe that's a good example. Uh, maybe following on what you're saying is, you know, you're you're a newer developer. You're looking at the code. You're in making changes to code, and you're thinking to yourself, man, this code is easy to change, or this code is really hard to change. How would I have done it differently, right? And you know, in your mind, you can apply this. Now, maybe you can refactor it, by the way. Maybe you can go back. That code that's hard to change, maybe you can refactor it and make it more open. And, you know, just um, because you have the, you know, you have this idea now. But who yeah. knows? Is it, you know. Sorry. I'm trying to look for a place to jump in. There's three of us who are all <laughs> trying to find that spot. But no, isn't go ahead, Rich. part of what you're saying the scars and the pains that we've gone through that others haven't. That's what that code smell is, right? I've seen this before. That doesn't feel right. It's going to be a problem later on. Yeah. Yeah. yeah you can't teach code smell. You know, no. Z-Man says, you try your best to think of real world use cases that might need extension. If it just seems cool, the seams might not need to be there. Seems. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I think you're taking the word seams that really feels to me like you're taking it from um, Michael Feather's use of, of seams in in uh, in testing legacy code, right? Where you find seams in the code to break it apart, to decouple it. Maybe Martin Fowler might use the same term. Um, but it's a but see, and the, this is the thing. So let's if if, if I'm going to go totally off the rails for a second here, and why is it that we talk about these things by name? Tonight, you've heard us drop some names. If you're a new developer, and this is the first time you've heard solid, open, close, single responsibility, the term seems. Um, we are, earlier, I also said the strategy pattern. We sort of kind of alluded to dependency injection, which is not quite the same as dependency inversion, the D in solid. We don't, as a community, I don't believe that these terms were invented to confuse you. They were invented so that we have a language that we can speak to each other without having to explain the whole, well, here's what I'm talking about. I'm talking about that way where we take code and we make it so that it's really easy to adapt. Instead, yes. we say, you know what I'm going to do? I, I think this calls for a strategy pattern. I think that, that choosing the tax rate to apply is a strategy per jurisdiction. So now we just need something that tells us what jurisdiction we're in. Then I'll go choose the strategy. I actually don't care what they are. And when I say I don't, I'm the person that applies it. Uh, I'm the class that applies it. I'm the class that applies the sales tax. Please just hand me the calculator so that I can run the price through it and get my answer. And then, and then I'll just walk away. Um, so we, we use this common nomenclature this common naming so that we can have these discussions. And then here's the great part is we, we use those terms over and over and over to mean the same thing that we later get confused uh, that we even call it overloading, right? We, and we even get confused about what we're talking about. So it's a fun <laughs> discipline, software development. That's certainly not an engineering dis discipline, like say civil engineering. If civil engineers built their bridges this way, we would all be in trouble but hopefully we get better and better at what we do to reduce the pain and bugs that sometimes are in very important systems. So well said. well said, I like that whole. Yeah, that was great. Like somebody should clip that and, and say that, like, and I'm not going to pretend I invented well, any of that. That is, is that all for, theory. No, I invented none of that. That is all, those are all things I've heard from friends like you. Uh, frankly, we heard some of it from from Z-Man tonight. We've heard it on this show. We've heard it on other shows from our mentors. I made up none of that. The only thing I made up is Gomez's law, which is the longer it takes you to delete a Git branch, the harder it will be for you to believe that you can delete it safely. And every time I say it, it's slightly. Every time I say it's slightly different. Like I, I'm always saying the same thing, but just like Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, it, I never get the sentence out the same way every time. Yeah, and fans of the show need to understand what Gomez's law is because we refer back to it a lot. Because we think that when we get uh, merch made up, uh, we're going to get merch that says like you know the Dev Talk show, and on the back it's going to say like Gomez, like I know what Gomez's law is, or something like that. Because you know we're, you're part of the family, you know, so. I mean, the um, law is the same. The law is immutable. It's just that I never say it the same way twice. <laughs> the law is Chris Gomez's law is immutable. That could be another, uh, another 
<laughs> Good another one. Law. You know, it'd be kind of funny to have, um, you know, like I want to get merch that says something that maybe it doesn't really say anything and people don't know what it's like. What is that even? Why does he have a shirt that says Gomez's law is immutable? But because it, it's just like it's a thing, you know, it's part of the show, um, you know. So, yeah. So listen, so that is the open close principle right now. We're down. We're, we're, we're two in on this on the uh, solid principles. Yeah, that's right. Two in. That's yeah, three to go. And if you enjoyed go. this, and you're watching on YouTube, so you're watching in the future, make sure you go hit the like button, the little thumbs up, especially if you're in a web browser, because the likes we see on a video will let us know that these are the kinds of topics you want us to see. And it's okay if you if you vote on, you know, dislike as well. It, it just helps us out. If you've got more to add to this conversation, add it in the comments. Definitely appreciate everybody who's jumped in the chat tonight. We heard a lot from, uh, from Z-Man Philly, from our longtime friend Bruno Julio and uh, and and humble Jay joined us, um, I believe, for the first time. I, I'm trying to remember if I've seen him here before, but you know he's already knows Java, so I hope that a lot of what you saw tonight was familiar. And if you're not following the channel here on Twitch, go. There should be a purple button down there to follow the channel so that you'll get notified when we go live. We are Wednesday nights, 8:30. U.S. Eastern Time, so that means we do shift with the U.S. Daylight Savings Time when that happens. We have to remember that in this this age of, of social distancing and, and, and live but recorded shows, you could be watching from anywhere, and we're glad that you are. So um, next week, we are going to take, uh, and I'm, I'm watching, making sure that my co-hosts nod because I think this is what's really going to happen, right? Is we're going to regardless take, of what it says in Meetup right now, yeah. we're going to change Meetup. Yeah, we're going to take a small break from the solid principles, and we are going to explore ASP.NET Core SignalR, which is SignalR is the technology where you can argue I got my start at Philly.NET, really exploring this one way for real time uh, web development. It's a, it's a tool to added to your arsenal along with your building your pages whether you use controllers or pages or components, I don't care what your framework of choice is. Now you want to send a message either from the client or to the client real time, and that's SignalR. So yep. can't wait to right. do that. I, I think Mark is asking for the L word. Uh, I think what he's referring to is the L in solid, which we yeah. will come back to. Right. But um, this show, uh, so what we ended up doing, just, you know, we're, we're open in our discussions here so people know, is we said, hey, let's do like a whole series of these solid principles, right? And I've done a lot of presentations on them, so I tend to drive these. And the show is not supposed to be like Andy's show, right? You know, like me doing all the presentations. So I'm not going to do five in a row. Uh, I want to give, everybody wants a chance. We want to bring some guests in, but we'll come back to them, right? Uh, that, that is our plan. Um, but I think we're going to take a break from solid for at least a week um, and then come back with L, which is Liskov substitution principle. Yeah. And we mean no disrespect to uh, Barbara Liskov, who, who created that one. We're going to we're going to take a pause here uh, before we get to her uh, her great principle. Oh, and that's an uh, interesting one, because I find it even more difficult to spot than what we've talked about so far. Yeah. Yeah. So that's i gotta say like of all the principles like i'm thinking maybe we're gonna do some other stuff during that show because it, it's kind of it's kind of short and quick like there's not a whole lot to talk about with that one i i don't think who knows who knows what we'll come up with to talk about um but you know we always do have like fun conversations and we go off on tangents a little bit that's part of being a live show that we just you know we have a good time yeah um so yeah so we're gonna do um uh what do you call it? Uh, signal R, which signal R is great. You know, what, what's great about signal R is um, I think it's one of those cool technologies. Some technologies that we have, you have to spend a lot of time with them, right? To really get good at them or to even just begin to implement them. And maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I'm simplifying it too much. But I think you watch a show like our, like what we're going to do next week on signal R and you're kind of like ready to go, Right. You can get started pretty quickly, and it integrates with a lot of clients, meaning like, you know, your JavaScript front end. It even integrates with your .NET front end. Um, so in a way, it's kind of portable. And uh, I've, I, I can't show everything that 
uh, some of the cooler things I've done with it because unfortunately they were proprietary, but I can discuss them. Like that's not, the code isn't mine yeah. to show, but the, right. the, the concept is absolutely open. And um, it's pretty amazing what can be accomplished with uh, like the real-time web protocol that, that normally today sits on top of WebSockets, but at one time, any real-time didn't matter, right? So we'll talk about all that next week. That's going to be a lot of fun. Different type of show next week from what we've had the last two weeks. But but if you're watching now and you're planning on coming back, we hope you will, think about SignalR or whatever and, you know, bring your questions, right? Uh, you know, bring your thoughts and, you know, what you think are good use cases and share them with us. Share them with us. Yep. Yep. So um, anyways, like I said, I, I'm really happy for all the, the great questions we got in chat, the great commentary. And Andy, thank you so much for putting that together. I think as all three of us know and many of you even in the chat know, that, that putting together something to talk about is not trivial. You don't throw it together in a short amount of time. It takes, you know, he, he definitely thought about what he wanted to tell us. And, uh, and that's always appreciated. And, and that's why we have other friends who will be on the show. Kevin Griffin was here earlier tonight. He was on our show talking about Azure Logic Apps. And you should go check that episode out on YouTube. All of our videos are at uh, video.thedevtalkshow.com. That'll take you right to our YouTube channel. And definitely check. That was a lot of fun with Kevin. We learned so much about how extensible, how much fun, how how fun it is to just tinker with logic apps. That was so much fun. <laughs> that was cool. Yeah, we tinkered right on the show. He he made some adjustments. And next thing you know, his logic app was tweeting live. You know, it was fantastic. So that's uh, right. That was cool. So anything else, Rich? Uh, Rich always behind the scenes, making sure everything's working great. And everything you saw with my end is, is was happening on my computer, my network. It was my just it just didn't want to cooperate tonight. But but Rich got you know the camera out of there, got it back in place. So thanks as always for making that just look perfect Seems, and flawless. Yes. <laughs> yeah. You know, I, I gotta say, like you know, some people run these things all on their own, right? Uh, and we do, we each do live streams on our own, and that's different. It's like one person, and, and we run the whole thing. Uh, running a show like this where there's multiple people on at once and screen sharing and audio and stuff like that, it's it's pretty complicated. It's, it's I wish it was a little simpler. It's it's pretty complicated. And it seems to take three of us, you know, to uh to run it. I mean, we we monitor the chat, Rich is Rich, you know, we we have the chat, we have the the you know, the switching, we have the featured chat that we pop up on a thing. We, it's a lot, right? Yeah, it's, I mean, it's got a piece. <laughs> Yeah. And Everybody's we're working on, you, you probably saw it during the show, we're working on where if you follow the chat, if you follow the, the channel, I think that's right, whether it's mm -hmm. either YouTube or I don't remember if it's, we'll get there, but it, we're working on an experimental feature where you will, we will thank our followers, uh, subscribers on YouTube and so on. And, and it's, it's a work in progress, so but you'll see us right, you'll see yourself right on the page. You see Wang is a follower right there. See that? So thank you for doing so. We definitely appreciate it. And yes, thank you. I think if we're done, Rich and Andy, I think so. I will definitely sign off. So, mm -hmm. on behalf of Andy Schwamm and Rich Ross, I'm Chris Gomez, and thank you very much. Join us at 8:30 p.m. Uh, next Wednesday. That'll be August 26th. <laughs> I think I have that right. <clears throat> and we'll see you <laughs> on the next. Yeah, have to double check. Have to look down. And we will see you on the next edition of the Dev Talk Show.